job you hated so much that you just wanted to walk up to the boss and say, I quit? <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to state Mike works full time for Centos, which is a they deliver things. I'm sure that's what he meant. <laughs> Mike, we'll talk afterwards. <laughs> well, there's a young lady who came up with a great way to tell her boss she quit. Let's watch. As it says on screen, it is past four in the morning, and Marina Schifrin has a message for her boss. Dancing to Kanye West's gun on desktops and in the aisles, it's her way of saying, I quit, which gets her approaching six million hits on YouTube since Saturday, and pages and pages of applause, and confirmation that the art of the quit is a dream that lives inside us all. It quit clip is its own YouTubeable art form. I am quitting this job. A man shows up at the chorus to say he's out of there. And then there's Joey DeFrancesco, who brought a band and said this to his boss. Stop quitting. Joey's got four million hits. I immediately start getting messages from all over the world. And in this job market yet, which is about what exactly? Escape, independence, delusion, revenge? Schifrin's has a certain poetic justice to it. The company where she made this video is a company that makes videos. The company said on one website it doesn't understand why she's mad at them. But while she said the company is awesome, she also complained it only cared about how many views each video gets. Now with nearly six million views for this, maybe Marina should be running the place. But no, too late, the lights are out, she's gone. John Donvan, ABC News, Washington. Well, that's a pretty creative way to quit. She was just tired of the treatment. If you read the one thing she said, she was tired of sacrificing her relationships and her life, and uh, she wanted to get a life. So she quit, in a creative way. Well, today we're going to look at King Rehoboam, and he had the entire northern kingdom say to him, we quit, and walked away from the king, and they did not use a YouTube video to tell him either. Last week we looked at King Solomon as he was in the prime of his life. He sought the Lord and received wisdom to govern the country wisely and to live wisely, but sadly as he got older, he began to make, a, he did not apply his wisdom to his own life. He had about a thousand concubines and wives, most of them foreigner women, who had other gods. He began to worship their gods, and he turned away from the Lord. And so he did not use his wisdom in his own life. As a result, his son Rehoboam, who was one of the children of one of these foreign wives, did not see the best example in his father. But we're currently in a series on the highlights of 1 Kings. We're just hitting a few sections of it we could spend the next year in 1 Kings. But uh, today we're going to be looking actually in 2 Chronicles, which mirrors 1 Kings through this section. As a matter of fact, a lot of the parts are word for word. Clearly the same author worked on some of this. But um, I want to highlight set from 2 Chronicles, but it's 1 Kings chapter 12 is what we're really looking at today. Let me give you a little background. Solomon was the third king of Israel, and he had just died. Rehoboam was his son, and he was chosen to follow him as king. He had big footsteps to step into. David, his grandfather, had, uh, had an amazing life, had uh, expanded the kingdom, and was a man, the Bible says, after God's own heart. Then his own father, Solomon, was the wisest man who had ever lived. The kingdom became wealthy under him. He built the temple and many other great things. So now it's Rehoboam's turn to lead the nation. And again, we're looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 10, um, even though it mirrors 1 Kings, we're going to be focusing on 2 Chronicles. It says this, Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone there to make him king. And when Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he was in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon. He returned from Egypt. So they sent for Jeroboam, and he and all Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, Your father put a heavy yoke on us. Now lighten the harsh labor, the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. And Rehoboam answered, Come back to me in three days. So the people went away. Now, it can be a little confusing. Rehoboam starts in the R. I think of Ray. Jeroboam is Jerry, you can think of. So they are two different guys, and uh, Rehoboam is the one we're focusing on today. Now, Solomon, as king, had achieved a lot of amazing things. He built the temple. He had uh, built an amazing palace. But he did all this through heavy taxation by forcing uh, the Israelites to serve in his army. And so they're coming to Rehoboam saying, listen, we need you to lighten up. Your father put a heavy, heavy burden on us. 
In addition to his building projects, like this amazing new palace, he also entertained foreign dignitaries like the Queen of Sheba. And again, he had a thousand wives and concubines with their families, their children, that all of the, uh, all this had to be supported from the government coffers. So the Israelites told Rehoboam they had suffered much under his father, the king. The word actually used in 1 Kings chapter 12 that we see again and again is the word yoke. It's used eight times. We see it here in verse 4 of chapter 10. The delegates mention this word, and it's probably a calculated word to, to really help the king understand just how he was making the people feel. You see, the Hebrew word for yoke was normally used in the Bible to speak of the burden that other nations had put upon the Israelites. So in other words, when they were enslaved in Egypt, the yoke was put upon them. When they were enslaved later by the Syrians, the Babylonians, the yoke was placed upon them. Now their own king, their own people were doing it to them. Now the messengers were frank, but they came with a polite request. They had a rather positive reassurance, and they gave a proper rationale. They basically said, lighten up, but they didn't demand too much. And they were quick to point out, hey, Rehoboam had not done any of these things. These were done by Solomon. They're not complaining about what he has done. And they also concluded by saying, listen, if you'll lighten up, we will serve you as our new king. Well, verse 6, then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father, Solomon, during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. And they replied, if you'll be kind to these people and please them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave. So he goes to the elders, these learned men, these wise men that his father had surrounding him that helped the kingdom grow so well, and says, what should I do? And they say, ease up, listen to them. But he immediately rejects the response. It seems here from how quickly he rejects that he probably went in there with his mind made up about what he was going to do. You ever done that? And you go to someone for advice, what do you think? You don't really want advice. You want them to say, you're right, that's exactly what you should do. It's one of the most frustrating things about being a pastor. Sometimes someone will come to me and they'll say, Mark, i got this decision. What do you think about this? Now, there's times where I have to say, listen, I don't know. You know, both options look good. You're just going to have to pray. I'll pray for you. God will give you wisdom. But there are other times where what they're going to do is against Scripture or it is just, I was going to say stupid, but that's a bad word. So I did not say stupid. I was going to say dumb, but I'll get in trouble for saying that. So they, they do something that's foolish. They do something completely foolish. And uh, am I okay, everyone? Is that better? Okay. <laughs> so they're foolish. You still said stupid. I did, I did say it, but I'm saying you shouldn't say it. See, I'm saying it like a way of don't say it. So they're foolish like I just was going through all that. And, um, <laughs> and I'll say to them, listen, that's, that's not, I, I can tell you right now, that's not a good decision. That's not a wise decision. You need to really read, well, but I want, but I'm telling you, that's, that's not wise. And yet so often they go and do it anyway, and then later on I see the consequences. And I see the problems their decision created. And it breaks my heart. And that's exactly what happens here. Rehoboam gets good advice, but he decides to ignore it. Verse 8. But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. And he asked them, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? The young men who had grown up with him replied, the people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips, I will scourge you with scorpions. So what they're saying is, listen, you tell the people, I'm not going to make it easier, I'm going to make it harder. So he says, my little finger was bigger than my father's waist. Now that's a Especially someone like me, that's a pretty big differentiation. You know? <laughs> We're talking about something fairly different. What they're saying is, listen, how many think he was bad? And he talks about the fact he scourged you with whips. In other words, maybe the, the overseers making them work, maybe they were whipped. He said, I'm going to scourge you with scorpions. And so they want to be clear that things need to get more difficult. His friends basically are saying to people, we don't care what you think. He's saying, basically, they want Rehoboam to say, listen, you're here to serve me. And you're here to do what I say. Now just be quiet and listen up. Well, verse 12. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam. As the king had said, come back to me in three days. And the king answered them harshly. Rejecting the advice of the elders, he followed the advice of the young men and said, My father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. 
And so the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from God to fulfill the word the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam. So he follows the advice of his friends. He ignores the advice of the, of the elders. He lacked humility. He lacked wisdom. The king was there to lead the people and to serve the people, not the other way around. During an operation, an experienced surgeon asked a young resident who was there with him, who's the most important person in this surgical room? The guy kind of looks around. He didn't think that the doctor was looking at his ego stroke. So he said, well, it's probably the nurses who serve so faithfully. And the surgeon said, no, it's the patient. The patient is the most important person in this room. Never forget that. Doctors make a lot more money than most of their patients. They are much more exalted than most of their patients. But ultimately, it's the patient who's important. And Rehoboam didn't realize. It was the kingdom that was important. God had placed them there to serve the people, to lead them in a godly way, to lead with justice and goodness. But he wanted it to be all about himself and acted like a tyrant. Well, verse 16. When all Israel saw the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king. What share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, Israel, look after your own house, David. So all the Israelites went home. But as for the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. So what share do we have in the house of David? David had united them. The northern kingdoms, the ten tribes, had been united by David with the southern two tribes into one. And they're, But this has only been for two generations. And they're saying, hey, What's David to us? You know, we weren't part of his tribe. And so they basically said, we're walking away. We're done with you. Not realizing that Rehoboam had destroyed the very kingdom that had been given to him. It had splintered. Under David, the, this alliance of the two kingdoms lasted 33 years. Jeroboam, three days later, he's crushed it. Under Solomon, 40 years, the kingdom grew. And now it's ended. Well, the two southern tribes that made up Judah remained loyal to the king, though. While the, other, while the other ten were gone. Verse 18 says this. King Rehoboam went out to Adon Adoniram, who was in charge of forced labor. But the Israelites stoned him to death. King Rehoboam, however, managed to get in his chariot and escape to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. So Rehoboam is not happy. These northern people who have decided they're going to leave, so he sends out the guy in charge of forced labor. He's using a heavy hand here. And what do they do? They kill the guy. And Rehoboam, the king, he has to flee in a chariot. Well, he had used a heavy hand and he failed. The clueless king finally begins to realize that they did not want him. They'd had enough of his youthful administration, enough of the southern kingdom. From now on, Things were going to revert to the past before David had united the all of Israel. The nations would be split, the north and the south. The young men told Rehoboam what he wanted to hear, and he listened to their bad advice, and it destroyed the kingdom. Not only affecting him and his family, but an entire nation. I think his experience gives us some insight into how we should make good decisions so we don't end up making choices like he did. The first thing is to seek God's wisdom. Did you notice in all this, what did he do? They, they come to him. He says something smart at first. Give me three days. Great idea. You know, often people want to pressure you into making an immediate decisions. Sometimes you need to stop and think and pray. And that's one thing we don't read about that he did. He didn't go talk to the high priest. Later we're going to read about a prophet. He didn't go talk to the prophet. Rehoboam's focus is on what are other people's advice? What do they think? You know, and all too often we do the exact same thing. We've got something, a big thing that comes up, but we don't say, God, what do you want me to do? Lord, give me wisdom, and then maybe seek out other advice. No, we, we, we talk to other people. We first think ourselves, what, what do I think I should do? Maybe we come up with a plan, pros and cons, pluses and minuses. Then we get some advice from other people, and then at the very end we go, oh, yeah, Lord, and please bless my decision. <laughs> well, friends, it doesn't work that way. God wants us to look to him first. Last week, we looked at uh, James chapter 1, verse 5, which reminded us, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to So if you don't know what to do, ask God. He wants to show you and give you the wisdom you need. It's a promise you can bet on. So seek the Lord first. <laughs> then secondly, seek godly advice. I mean, Rehoboam, he had the right idea as he went to the wise elders who had given his father good advice. But he did not like their advice. So he turned to his young friends, kind of hotheads like him, 
who had little experience and no wisdom. You know, he sought the wrong kind of people's advice, kind of like the people in this video do. Who's gonna pay five dollars for your help? Yeah, man, you don't know nothing about nothing. I know a lot about stuff. And thanks. Y'all just ignorant. <laughs> Not my fault. Stupid gravity. Here is your tax return. Go ahead and sign and send it to the IRS. Wow! My refund is more than I made last year. Yeah, I got a little creative. Oh, uh, yeah. You claimed kitty litter as a business expense? That is where your cat does his business. <laughs> Duh. Please, you need to get your real accountant. He is in no way an expert in this area. When you're on the catwalk, you want to lead with your hips and pause, turn. Thank you. Next. My car won't start. I want to know if it's because my battery's dead. Dude, there's a great mechanic like two blocks from here. All right, I'm going to test it to see if this battery's got any charge. How are you going to do? Watch and learn. I would not do that. Battery is good. That'll be five dollars. Next. <laughs> okay. People, you need to seek out someone with expertise in the area in which you require help. Okay, so none of us are foolish enough to ask that guy for advice or help on our taxes. Or how to walk on a runway, although he did seem to have some pretty good motion there. But, uh, but the bottom line is this. Lots of people love to give advice. You can get all kind of input from all kind of people, but are you getting advice from the right kind of people? Are you getting the correct advice, godly advice? We need to seek out those who have true wisdom from God and listen to their advice. Now that doesn't mean they're always going to be right. But if Rahab had listened to the elders when he asked their advice, the outcome would have been very different for him. You know, back when I was finishing seminary, Deb and I were engaged, and I was looking for associate pastor positions. And uh, Deb's brother-in-law was an associate, was a pastor in Washington, New Jersey, of Alliance Church, and they were looking for an associate pastor. And they interviewed me along with some others, and eventually called me and said, "We'd like to hire you, Mark. We'd like you to come." So I went and I talked to some of my seminary professors, godly people who would study, who knew the Lord. And I said, what's your advice on this? What's your input? I said, you know what, Mark? He's been in the family, the brother-in-law, for over 15 years. You're just going to be coming in the family in a couple of months. If there's ever any problems between the two of you, it's going to become a family problem. And you're the new guy in the family, and you're going to come out not looking good. He said, don't do it. You know, I listened to their advice. And maybe a decade later, a nephew went and, uh, and worked as a youth pastor for him. And I don't know what happened, but there was a falling out between them. And it was an issue within the family for many years. And I just thanked God that I had the wisdom to listen to those men who had more wisdom than I did, had more experience in life than I did. And I got their advice and put it into practice. You know, as we face large or small decisions, <laughs> cultivate relationships with godly people. Bring people into your life. Let them in who will give you the kind of advice that you need. We're called to serve each other. Because see, the thing is, if you go to people who don't know the Lord for advice, sometimes the things they're going to tell you make sense in a worldly point of view. Well, that person was mean to you. You should give, you know, they're, they're not going to talk about forgiving. They're not going to talk about grace. That's not part of their world. And so we need to look for the right kind of input. You know, we're called to serve others, to give generously, to treat others equally, to be humble and gentle. Often kingdom values are the opposite of the world's values. So who are you going to look to? when you're making your decisions. You know, it's easy to think that we're doing the right thing. We're really just doing what the flesh would want us to do. So seek God's wisdom, seek God the advice, and then obey the Lord. Chapter 11, verse 1. When Rehoboam arrived in Jerusalem, his, his capital, he mustered Judah and Benjamin, the two remaining tribes, 180,000 able young men to go to war against Israel and to regain the kingdom for Rehoboam. But this word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God. 
Say to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel and Judah and Benjamin, this is what the Lord says, do not go up to fight against your fellow Israelites. Go home, every one of you, for this is my doing. So they obeyed the words of the Lord, and they turned back from marching against Jeroboam. The Lord gives a clear message, both to the king and to the people. This has been my doing, and you are not to go and fight against your own people. You're to just go home. And thankfully, Jeroboam, or Rehoboam listened to what was being said to him. You know what? If he hadn't listened, there's a good chance he probably would have died. The great king Josiah, one of my favorite kings in the Old Testament, who brought the people back to the Lord after they had been for many years not serving God, he himself died in battle because he went out to fight a battle that God had been clear he was not to fight, and his life was taken. You know, it's an important reminder to us, sometimes we forget that our willful disobedience has consequences. We need to obey the Lord when he tells us to do something. We need to listen. We can't afford to argue. When the Spirit says do it, we need to do it, we need to obey. Well, after this, Rehoboam turned back to the Lord. He began to strengthen his border cities. He received a large influx of the Levites, who were the people who worked in the temple, which was in Jerusalem, and also godly people. Why did they go to Judah? Because Jeroboam had now become king in the north. Rehoboam's in the south, Jeroboam's in the, in the north. And since the center of worship is in Jerusalem, Jeroboam decides to set up his own golden calves for his people to worship. And so he turned them to idolatry and turned them away from God. Verse 16. Those from every tribe of Israel who set their hearts on seeking the Lord, the God of Israel, follow the Levites to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices to the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and supported Rehoboam, son of Solomon, three years, following the ways of David and Solomon during this time. So the people of God came to the southern kingdom. And God was merciful and established firmly the, the kingdom there. Rehoboam for a long time ruled wisely. We're told for three years he and the people followed God. But then he turned away. Verse 1 of chapter 12. After Rehoboam's position as king was established and he had become strong, he and all Israel with him abandoned the law of the Lord. I mean, while he was weak, he relied on God. I mean, his kingdom was not doing well, his border cities aren't fortified, and he wants God's help. But once he felt strong enough, he stopped serving the Lord. You know, the sad thing is how often are we like that? You know, when things are bad, something tough happens, boy, we run to God, Lord, I need your help, I want your presence. When things are going well... Eh, you know, thanks God. And we ignore him. Well, we need to keep our eyes on God. Return to the Lord. Verse 2. Because they had been unfaithful to the Lord, Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem in the fifth year of King Rehoboam. With 1,200 chariots and 60,000 horsemen and the innumerable troops of the Libyans, Sukites, and Cushites that came with him from Egypt, he captured the fortified cities of Judah and came as far as Jerusalem. Then the prophet Shimeiah came to Rehoboam and to the leaders of Judah who had assembled in Jerusalem for fear of Shishak, and he said to them, This is what the Lord says. You have abandoned me, therefore I now abandon you to Shishak. And the leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, The Lord is just. The people and the king had abandoned God, and so God abandoned them. It reminds me of a t-shirt I saw in college. Maybe you know Nietzsche was the famous philosopher who was well known for saying God is dead. Well, he was, I don't know, 100 years ago, something like that. So the t-shirt had a picture of Nietzsche, and at the top it said, Nietzsche, quote-unquote, God is dead. And at the bottom it said, God, quote-unquote, Nietzsche is dead. I always appreciate the humor of that. Well, the fact is, people abandoned God, so God abandoned them and turned away from them and allowed the Egyptians to come and attack them because they were no longer faithful to him. But what I love is the response of the leaders and the king. The last verse, verse 6, they humbled themselves and said, the Lord is just. They didn't say, God, how can you do this to us? This isn't fair. They didn't start to rage against the Lord. They understood, you know what? Yeah, we abandoned God. What we're getting is what we deserve. How often is our response like that? You know, so often when we make our own bad situation, then we go, God, why are you doing this to me? God's going, I, 
I, I didn't do that to you. You did that to you. For some reason, when we do things, we don't expect the consequences to come. And when they do come, then we say, God, why would you do this? Well, the leader's response should challenge us. Verse 7. When the Lord saw that they had humbled themselves, this word of the Lord came to Shimei. Since they have humbled themselves, I will not destroy them, but will soon give them deliverance. My wrath will not be poured out in Jerusalem through Shishak. They will, however, become subject to him, so that they may learn the difference between serving me and serving the kings of other lands. So God says, I'm going to be merciful, I'm going to rescue them, but I am going to let Shishak have authority over them, so they can see who is easier to serve. Some foreign king or the Lord your God. But because they had humbled themselves at the last minute, God saved them from the destruction that was coming. You see, God hears us when we humble ourselves. When we admit to him that we need him. We come completely broken, realizing we need his mercy. Then he is quick to offer it to us every time. Now even though Rehoboam was not destroyed, he faced the humiliation of now being really subservient to a foreign king... And also having the gold and many other items that his nation had amassed taken away. The Lord allowed this foreign ruler over Judah to prevent them from having pride once again. So God relented from his wrath and God removed the consequences of their sin. Now thankfully they returned to the Lord or they would have been destroyed. And you know friends, we need to be careful. We need to understand that God wants us to come back. Yes, we fail. Yes, we fall. But God wants to do a new work in us each day. I think I've mentioned this guy before. When I was in college, there was a guy named Bill Ford in my dorm. And uh, he was a freshman with me. Had kind of thick black hair that he would grease back. And he loved Elvis. Elvis was the king. Now, this is like the 87, back when Elvis is dead and he's not the king. And nobody who's 19 loves Elvis. But he's always walking around, well, since my baby left me, I found a new place to dwell. We're like, all right, come on. The thing about Bill was this. He had been born and raised in a Christian home, and yet he was not walking at all for the Lord. He was kind of living a double life. He'd call himself a Christian, but you really couldn't see it in any way, shape, or form. Well, at the end of his freshman year, he decided he was going to join the Marines. And I remember him coming to a couple of us before he left for boot camp, and he said, listen, you need to pray for me. He said, I realize that this is going to kind of make or break the direction of my life. Do I fall away from the Lord, or do I follow God? Well, I'll be honest. You know, I prayed for him, but my faith was small. And I just thought, this guy's already in trouble. What are the, what are the Marines going to do for him? And you know what? He came back from boot camp on fire for Jesus. He said, I found some Christians in my unit. We had a Bible study. It was amazing. And man, I'm serving the Lord. And it was so, it was just amazing to see the difference. And a guy who turned back to his Savior and allowed Jesus to change him. He saw his need and he returned to the Lord. You know, Bill could have gone either way. You know, the same is true for all of us here. For some of his reign, King Rehoboam was on the right track. He was walking with God, but then he walked away. And just as Rehoboam's failure resulted in losing a significant portion of his kingdom and impacting a lot of people's lives, so when we turn away from God, we hurt those around us, and we make mistakes to harm us. You know, so often we ask God for direction. We're at a crossroad. Lord, what do I do? I have, I have this choice here. What should I do? The question we need to ask ourselves is this. Do we really want God to answer us? And if he does, are we going to listen to what he says? Or have we already decided what we want and we're going to go our own way? Are we like Rehoboam? Are we just looking for God to confirm what we've already decided? If we want God to show us where we need to go, then we need to be willing to sacrifice our will for his will. We need to be willing to lay down what we want for what he wants. Making good decisions, friends, it is possible. God will give you his wisdom if you seek him first. If you look for it, there are godly people who will give you wise advice. And then as you obey him and return to him, God will do amazing things if you will seek him. Let's pray.